Welcome to Inspiration Church! Amen. It is a great day. You go ahead and take your seat. Take your seat where you are. Introverts, when I say talk to your neighbor, um, you can just look at them. You don't necessarily have to talk to them, but you can just look at them. And as you look at them, I pray that God starts to uncover some things. Sometimes we let our personalities get in the way. Anybody ever experienced that your personality is in the way of God's blessings? You're looking for stuff, but you're scared to talk to people. Like you, you want more business clients. You want to get married, but you don't like people talking to you. You don't like being around people. And that's an idiom, but that's kind of how we do because we live a paradoxical life. Meaning we say one thing, but we do another thing. We, we do one thing, but we expect something else. And, and we're wondering why things aren't matching up, why things aren't quite clicking together. But it's because sometimes we don't know who we are. I'm still learning myself. I'm still learning some new things about myself every day. I was talking to my wife. We were driving home from Oklahoma yesterday and we were listening uh, to a sermon. And after it, I said, do you, do you think we were complete and whole before we got married. She was like, I don't think we whole now. And I was like, well, hold on, wait a minute. Screw it. <laughs> and, and as she began to talk, um, I realized that when we got married, uh, we weren't whole. Um, I actually got married because I was looking for somebody to complete the things that were not complete inside of me. I was looking for somebody to be the answer to all of life's problems for me. Whatever I struggled with, whatever I told with, I wanted her to come alongside of me and make that up. And when that didn't happen, it was devastating. Because my, my, my inclination was like, well, why did I get married? I got a little feedback coming in. And so this morning, I want to talk about the power of being single. How many single people? Make some noise. You, you're single, single. See, I said, make some noise, not raise your hand. No, y'all trying to look for us. Make some noise. Okay, let's try to. When you make noise, you can either clap your hands or you can go, woo, all right. Make some noise if you're single. All right, there we go. There we go. There we go. See, now you know who to look for. Turn around, do it again, see who, see who prospects, prospect park. We're trying to find out who's single in the place so we can make some matches. No, we, we don't want to make any matches because y'all going to burn up something. Because when you're not ready, that's what happens. Combustion happens. When, when you connect with people. But there's something that, that's about singleness, and I know married people are like, well, why are we talking about single? Like, I'm here to learn about screw it and marriage, and you're talking about single. But the, the problem with marriage is the individuals. Marriage in its entity is perfect. It is the best thing that God ever created on earth until people show up. And then when you show up, it is the worst thing that you could have ever been in in your life. Some of y'all are sitting next to your wives and your husbands right now, and you're like, man, he telling the truth because I'm so tired of dealing with you and all of this stuff that you got going on. And, and it's a part of us not really being whole and single. Um, you've heard this statement. This is my better. That makes no sense. But yet and still, we say it so casually because we want to be whole in our relationship. But we make statements like you my better half. I don't know what I would do if you would leave me. That means that by myself, I'm not enough. And we sing these songs and we, we, we make these chants and these mantras and we, we sing about how we were lonely. And, and, and now at this point, people are killing themselves faster than they were years ago. Why? Because we're not happy with me. You talk bad about yourself. I'm too fat. I'm too short, too tall. Uh, my, my feet too big. My nose is too big. My ears are too big. I mean, you, you look in the mirror. I can't wear this. Can't wear that. And you are self-hatred. And you expect to connect with somebody else. And you wonder why you're picking out all the flaws inside of them because you're not happy with yourself. And so you struggle with, with, with being happy with somebody else because you're tired of being by yourself. God, when is it going to be me? When is it my turn? When are you going to send my Boaz or his broke? I mean, whatever it is that you're trying to, 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 to get inside of you, you're like, God, when are you going to send me the person? I realized this week that I, I, I idolized marriage before I was married. Idolized it. Thought about it day and night. 
day and night, I thought about when I'm going to get married. God, when are you going to send me the one? When am I going to be in the right place? God, when am I going to get married? When am I going to be in the right place? I'm tired of being alone. God, when are you going to bring me the right one? I'm tired of being alone. I'm tired of being alone. I'm tired of being alone. I'm tired of living alone. I want to be with somebody. To the point that I had put marriage above God. See, there's a difference between being single and unmarried. A lot of singles identify as unmarried because their whole focus is to get married, as opposed to living life whole. I would ask you to raise your hand, but a lot of y'all lied last week. The sermon I preached last week, if you were not here last week, it was about uh, pornography. It was uh, the power of pornography. And I said, if you ever struggle with porn, raise your hand. I was the only one raising my hand. But it is the most viewed on any sermons that I've ever preached in this year. It is the most viewed. So somebody was lying. And I won't point you out because God will convict you. I was up here by myself after church. People, man, that was good. I needed that. I was like, what was you at when I was up there by myself? Struggling. Embarrassed. I mean, had a chicken out here. One deep. So, right. So, I'm not going to ask y'all to raise your hand no more because y'all be lying. And I don't want y'all to go to hell for lying in church. So, I won't ask you that anymore. So, I would just assume that we're all in the same boat based on the views that we all struggle with the same stuff because we're humans. And we all have our own struggles. And seriously, culturally, we're more alike because we have adopted a culture that feeds how we respond to things, how we act, how we feel, our moods, our, our, how happy we are, how sad we are, the things that we struggle with in the closet. And so this morning, I want to talk about being single. The truth of it is, all of you are single. You're like, no, I'm not. I just got me. No, you're single. You're a single person, and single doesn't mean that you are somehow defective. It just means that you are a single one. And when you get whole people and you put whole people together, what happens is an abundance of wholeness. But when you put two halves together, you get another half, and you wonder why you always looking for what you don't have. Because you don't have enough to, to pour into another person. I submit to you this morning that the problem with your marriage, if you're married, is a singleness problem. Because marriage does not answer anything. You thought that you was going to stop being addicted to that stuff when you got married. You're still struggling with it. You thought that you were going to, to be able to, to uh, uh, be more of, uh, of a better worker and you was going to be more accountable and more responsible. No, you're still the same. Now, all of a sudden, you got to deal with that person's problems and you got your own problems. And now you're like, man, I got more problems than I got before I was married. How many of y'all was doing better before you was married? Don't answer that question because I want y'all to stay married. I mean, you was on top of your game. Your devotion life was good. Business was booming. You was connecting with people. You had the best life. Then you got married, and it seemed like everything just went down. Miss Patty. <laughs> but it happens to us. And, and really, when we, we hook up with people, uh, we're not really taught what characteristics to look for in a mate. And our families judge us from bringing Sam around or Tim around or, 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 or Rashida around. And we, we're so like, why did he bring her? But nobody taught Billy how to pick a woman. Nobody taught Rashida how to pick a husband. Nobody taught them exactly what to do. And so we're running around here connecting with people that really will bring us down. I got an illustration. Go ahead. I was going to wait till later to bring this out, but you know what? I'm going to bring this out now because I'm going I'm to preach to this thing. Is it all right if I show you an illustration? No chickens this week because I know the women didn't get that joke last week, but all the men did. So uh, I hope y'all didn't look that up when y'all left, uh, but if you did, it's cool. And so uh, anybody ever read the Message Bible? Don't raise your hand because y'all be lying. So the Message Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you have that on your phone, go to your phone, go to the Message Bible. If you've got the little brown Bible, if you don't have the Bible on your phone, download it real quick. Make sure you turn the internet off because it may not do it because we're in the school's internet. Uh, but turn that off. Download the, the Bible. I think it's the Holy Bible. It's the version app. Uh, download that. 
and pull up the Message Bible. First Corinthians 7 in the Message Bible is like, man, I'm like, man, I'm going to read this Bible forever because sometimes you don't read your Bible because you don't understand what in the world is talking about, especially if you got to hold to the King James Version. It doesn't make sense. I get that. It makes sense. But when you look at this First Corinthians 7, I was like, man, how much of this am I going to read to the people? I said, I'm going to read the whole thing because it's, it's solid. Like it's solid information, and I want to be able to preach through this particular passage so that you can look at uh, what is happening in, in the midst of this. Um, some of you know that the divorce rate is uh, at, what, 50, 56 percent, something like that. Uh, crazy. So that means that it is like saying that when you drive to work, you got a one out of two chance of making it there. How many people will you still go to work? Like, no, that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to do that. And so people are not getting married because they either feel like it may end in divorce or... They're like, screw it. So, and that's what culture has brought us to this particular point this morning. But I pray that after this particular message, you will be comfortable with wherever you are. That if you're married, married people, raise your hand. All right. You'll be comfortable in being married. Single people, raise your hand. You'll be comfortable where you are. You will be able to use your singleness and your marriedness to be able to glorify God in everything uh, that you do. All right. So, First Corinthians chapter seven reads like this, and this is Paul. Paul is talking uh, to the church in Corinth, and he, it, it's titled "To Be Married, To Be Single." Everybody see that? All right. So, there's gonna be some scriptures come up up here. It's not gonna sound as good as this one because this one just kind of lays it out for this. It says, "Now, getting down to the question you asked in your letter to me, first, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly." but only within a certain context. That's this bottle of water. As long as sex is in marriage, it is good. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a wife to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide a balance and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. I'm going to read that one more time. Sexual drives are strong. Anybody can agree? Okay, don't agree out loud. All right, but marriage is strong enough, meaning that it's strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. Y'all get that? Like, sex has been used out of order, so it is out of order. It is in disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights, men and women. This is not to declare your borders of safety. This is for giving and receiving. Marriage is a decision. Say it's a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. Abstaining from sex is permissible only for a period of time if you both agree to it. And if its purposes are for prayer and fasting and only for such times, then come back together again. Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. I'm not, understand, commanding these periods of abstinence, only providing my best counsel if you should choose them. The marriage bed is a place of mutuality. Marriage is not a place for you to stand up for your rights. A lot of issues that we have is because uh, we didn't do singleness right. And since we didn't do singleness right, we're trying to do singleness inside of marriage. Because you like buying your own stuff. You like not having to answer anybody about how you spend your money. You like going out. If you wake up at 2 in the morning and you want to go get, I hop and get something to eat, you like just being free and roaming around. And then when you get married, now you're like, oh, I got to feel like I feel like I got to ask permission for everything. I can't go by this. Why are you questioning me about the money all the time? And what you're really doing is trying to have your identity stroked inside of marriage. But that was supposed to happen outside of marriage. Because when it happens outside of marriage, when you come inside of marriage, you don't have to struggle and toil for your independence. See, a lot of us get married and we are not totally self-sufficient and happy with who we are. See, when you have, I, I have alone issues. Like, I, I hate being alone. I hated being alone. I still hate being alone. I hate it. I just hate being by myself. I'm an extrovert. I like being around people. I like stuff moving. I like people over to the house. I like that type of stuff. And whenever it's too quiet, I'm ready to go do something. 
But my wife says I have an issue. She said, you don't know how to be alone. And in my mind, I'm like, well, you're an introvert. Of course you would say that. You could spend your whole life by yourself. So it's, it's hard for me to accept that from her. Because <laughs> that's her natural propensity is to be alone. But then I had to really start thinking about that. Like, why can I not be by myself? Is it because I'm tired of being around myself? Or is it because I have some things that are going on inside of me that, that I, I, I hate fighting with or, or dealing with? So I'm still working through that because of this conversation that we had last week. Well, yesterday. And she says, well, I have these issues of, of, of insecurities. And when you bring those two things to the table, expecting the other person to fulfill your loneliness and the other person to fulfill your insecurities, and that doesn't happen, there is friction in the marriage. So people ask me uh, all the time, well, uh, Pastor, you know, my wife is doing this, so she don't do this, and my husband does this, and they don't do that. And it's, we're, we're always reaching for something. We always want more. We want more. We want more. She don't cook. She don't clean. She don't do this. But what marriage does is exposes you to the world, shines a light on you. If you didn't know that you had issues, guess what? When you get married, they're all out the bag. Because you are now in a predicament and in a place where a person watches your every move. I'm tired of my wife watching my every move. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it, and I, I want out. I don't want out of my marriage. I just don't want her to watch my every move. Because I know I'm not perfect, and I'm okay with not being perfect. But it's, the problem happens when, when these things tug at you so much that they are almost detrimental to your life. So single people, uh, when we're going out in the world and searching for somebody, my hope for you is that you don't search too long and that that does not become your major priority. Your major priority right now as a single person is to be trying to make sure that you are whole. And the way that you make sure that you are whole is by investing in yourself. The greatest thing that you can do right now is know who you are. Know your sleep patterns. Know if you snore at nighttime. Know if you really don't like sleeping next to people. Well, scratch that one, because I don't want you to find out that before you get married. Find out, do you like to cook or not? Do you always eat out? Do you manage your time wisely? Know these things before you get into a marriage, because guess what? When you get into a marriage, all of that stuff is going to be exposed. And if you don't know yourself now, you're going to be miserable in marriage. Because those things were not worked on in the beginning. So what I have here is I have an egg. Everybody say egg. I got an egg. Now, what happens when, when eggs get together, and this happens even before, before marriage, because y'all know we hooking up before marriage now, right? We're two weeks in. I love her. I love him. We infatuated. We don't know what love is. Until you get married, you don't really understand love, because love is married people. Tell them what love is. Clap real one time. You can tell them what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he keep going. He's he going to be in trouble when he get home. I'm not going to be with him. So I got this, I got this experiment because God was giving me this. And did I leave that fork? Don't tell me I left that fork. Mark, can you look back there and see if that fork is in that uh, thing there? So what happens is, and this is what's, what's happening in the world today, but also in marriage. So, so we, we're these eggs, right? And, and we connect with, with other eggs because we like to have an excellent time. Okay, small joke. All right. So these eggs come together and, you know, your third night or your two weeks or your six month rule or whatever it is you have and you start connecting with people. What we do is thank you so much. Y'all give it up for Mark always being there to help me. I appreciate you, Mark. It's when we connect with people, we mesh with them. Right. So we 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 lay down in bed with them and we. And I was good before I met you. Life was perfect. I was pure. I was who I was. I had no issues before I got married. I had no issues before we started dating. Before we hooked up, my life was perfect. I woke up when I felt like it. I was always to work and church on time, but now things have changed. And so you're this one egg, and you're working on being single, and you're working on being, being whole, and you're working on uh, your business, and you got ideas, and you got inventions, and things that you're, you're working on. And you, you are living great, but then you hook up with this knucklehead. 
or this girl that, 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 that has crossed paths with you, but you're so tired of being lonely because you just want egg. And you're tired of going to weddings by yourself, and you're tired of going out to parties, and it's only reservations for one. And you see all of your married friends on Instagram, and you're like, man, I can't wait. Where's my boo coming? And so you're like, man, you know what? This person don't have everything that I want, but I'm going to hook up with him just because I'm tired of being lonely. And so you wind up getting yourself in a situation where you hook up with someone that has some issues. Now, what color is this egg? Yellow. The issue with married people are people that are single. They think that they can do without certain things when they connect with other people because they feel like they can change the other person. But the problem is the good, very chances are nil to none that in marriage, your good is going to take over the other person's bad stuff. Anybody agree with that? Like, yeah, they ain't changing. You thought that you was bringing them to church and they ain't changing. It ain't, it ain't working. It ain't working. You're like, well, I go to church. I've been to church six years by myself. My husband ain't never came because he wasn't it just, hey, you hooked up with that egg. <laughs> Sorry. Got you. So when you connect with them, then you are now in marriage with that person, and they've got fractures in their character, and, and they've got insecurity issues, and they've got alone issues, and they've got addictions, and they've got uh, timeliness issues, and they don't really like people that much, and they got issues with everything, and they talk real loud, and they from the hood, and they go off on you in public, and you don't like it that much, and they, they do certain things, and he beats you, and he hits you across the head, and y'all got a violent relationship. And y'all get together and y'all start to mix it. Now, the issue is when you get married and you thought the other person that you was going to be able to change them, what really happens is they change you. And this is why the Bible says to be, not to be, unequally yoked. And so the issue that we have in life today is that when we get all messed up and we realize that we didn't like them or we get all mixed up with them, we like, you know, we've been dating for the last seven years. We might as well do this. We ain't getting no younger. I might as well confess. Then we walk down the aisle and she has that beautiful dress on and you got that nice tux on. And for that day, it's magical. It's memorable. Everybody is standing at attention. This is the best day of your life. You're like, man, this is going to be awesome. And what you do on a marriage day is you make an omelet. And you are now poured out. Is this thing on? So the first day is good. Like we married, baby. This is going to be the, the, the world is, is awesome. And then all of a sudden the next day comes and you realize that they breath stink really bad. And, and that she, uh, her house was always kind of clean when you went to her house. But now you realize she only cleaned up before you came over and she really didn't clean all the time. And you realize that he, why he spending so much time in his room by himself? And why he on the video game? And she's spending all her time on Instagram scrolling. And you're like, why is she watching hip hop? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about y'all because some of y'all watch this show. And, and, and you're like, well, he watched sports all day. And so you're upset with who this person is because now you see everything that they do. And now it's like, well, God, Lee, I thought they was going to grow up. Like, and then they lose their job. Anybody been married and then one spouse lost their job? And then you had expectations that when you came home, the house was going to be clean and food was going to be cooked. And they were still in their bed clothes when you got home. And you was like, what in the world was you doing all day? And your oil need to be changed and the car need to be uh, fixed and you got a flat tire and your husband sitting there playing video games. And you like, where are your priorities? But these things that we didn't see when we were single. And since we didn't see them when we were single, we, we hooked up with them and things started to marinate and come together and, and they started to bake together. Now it was just him late, not both of y'all late. Now it was just him using drugs, not both of y'all using drugs. At first it was just, it was just, just her doing that, but now it's both of y'all. Now y'all done had a kid together because y'all was unhappy with each other and you thought if you could just have a kid, it was going to make everything better. 
Then you started giving all your attention to the kid and not giving him enough attention. And then he stepped outside of the marriage because he's looking for somebody to love him. And then at this point, you're like, you know what? I'm sick of it. I'm ready to do what? Screw it. This is not working. I'm ready to be done with this particular thing. And you're like, Pastor Carlos, well, why are you talking about this first? Because I'm talking about it because you need to know who you are in your singleness so that you don't make an omelet with somebody that's green. Because what's about to happen next is what the Bible talks about as, as being something that's disorderly. So in Malachi 2, chapter 16, now take this to your friends. You can write it down, text it, text it out. Malachi 2, cha- uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. Malachi 2, verse 16. This is the next thing. Malachi 2, verse 16. Uh, Malachi talks about how God feels about divorce. He says, I hate divorce, says the God of Israel. God of the angel army says, I hate the violent dismembering of the one flesh of marriage. So watch yourselves and don't let your guard down. Don't cheat. Now, he compares marriage and divorce to a violent act. Now, he says he hates divorce, not the divorcee. So if you've been divorced, God doesn't hate you. He just hates divorce because if you've been through a divorce, you know how violent it is. See, it's almost better. Now, listen to this. Make this make sense. It's almost better for a person to die than to get a divorce. Divorce is worse than death. Because when a person dies, you can go to the funeral, crawl over the casket, put them in the ground, and they're done. You don't have to worry about running into them anymore. You may have memories that come back up. Things may happen. And guess what? There's closure there so you can move on. But when you're divorced, you got to see them at the grocery store. You got to pick up the kids together. And every time you see them, you're like, here come this. Oh, why she all here? She come nagging again. And if you have kids, it's even worse because now you're stuck for life with this person that you really didn't yoke with because you hooked up trying to complete something that really was incomplete in the beginning. So you got this this omelet that you have hooked up with. And I probably should have used some butter. But this is how marriage is when you ain't right because you're missing the ingredients and you really forgot to do your homework before you got married and you picked her up and now you wonder why things not working right. Like your business ain't working right, your health is bad, you're getting big and people don't like you and you don't like them and you're wondering why they do certain stuff and there's residues everywhere and life sucks for me right now and I'm, God, how long do I have to be stuck with this person? And you stuck to the pan because you didn't do right before you got in it. And I'm sorry married people, but you married now so you stuck inside of it and you got this omelet that is messed up you're trying to make it work you're trying to get him to go to counseling but he don't want to go to counseling because he know it all you're trying to get her to do some stuff and she don't want to do that either and now she want to go to he want to go to counseling but you don't want to go to counseling seems like y'all can never get on the same page and y'all stuck with each other and now y'all to the point where you're like you know what man I just need to go ahead and part our ways bro like It ain't working. There's only one prerequisite to divorce. That's cheating. If a person steps outside the marriage, God gives permission for there to be a divorce. But God hates, say that with me, say God hates divorce. Because what happens in divorce is that the two people that were together then, even in their messed upness, have to be torn apart. And that's violent. Because once the omelet is made and it's torn apart, guess what happens? You can't go back to being an egg. So the thing that you failed to do at the beginning, after you have gotten hooked up with the wrong person, you can't go back to this. And that's why he says it's it's violent because the two have become. And when they're torn apart and you're like, well, you just said we was all single. But something happens in marriage where it connects in the spirit. And when you tear that spiritually apart, it, it ain't good. 
because two souls are being ripped apart. That's why the judges can't give you a divorce. Pastors can't give you a divorce. Nobody can give it to you because they can give you a sheet of paper. But what happens spiritually, nobody can give you that. So the goal is single people, don't be rushing into this because you might look like this on drugs. Don't you love TV? We can all have these common. This is your brain. This is your brain. Okay. So here are the things that we have to, to be cautious of because how many of y'all really want this with your life? Raise your hand. Raise it high. We don't want this. We want a perfect omelet with onions and peppers and uh, uh, spinach, and we want all kind of good stuff because that's what God made marriage. He made it to be good. But when you screwed up and they screwed up, that's what you're going to look like. And now you can't get on one accord. You don't know what school you're going to send your kids to, where you want to live. You can't live like that because you were two halves trying to make a whole. So there are some things that, that I want to submit to you that will help you to master singleness. Say master singleness. And I'm going to run through these really quickly. One of the reasons why we have issues in our singleness is because we don't manage our time correctly. We spend more time thinking about why we're alone than really enjoying life. Like in your singleness, it's your time to create businesses. It's your time to go out and paint, see the world, travel, do all kinds of things, read books, get intelligently smart, go and find different circles of people to connect with, to achieve things in your singleness. And then as you achieve things, then God says it's not good for that person to be alone. And then he gives that person a connection. The problem is society tells you that if you by yourself, something's wrong with you. You 35 and you ain't got no boo. What's wrong? What happened? Like, what's what's going on with you? And if you go to some churches and you come in there without a wedding ring on and you 40, they're going to really be looking at you like, what's happening with you? Like, oh, is everything OK? I mean, is 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 everything OK down? Everything working well? Or do you have some issues going on? And so it makes you feel like you're less than a person because of. Singleness. Now, this is what Paul says. Paul says it's better for you to be un. Society says if you are unmarried, something is. What? So if we're taking our cues from society, then guess what? We will always be led astray. Always. So this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's go back to that. It says, Paul says, he says, sometimes I wish everyone were single. Like me, a simpler life in many ways. But celibacy is, not, celibacy is not for everyone, any more than marriage is. God gives the gift of single life to some, the gift of married life to others. I do, though, tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might well be the best thing for them as it has been for me. But if they can't manage their desires and emotions, they should by all means go ahead and get married. The difficulties of marriage are preferable by far to a sexually tortured life as a single. And if you are married, stay married. This is the master's command, not mine. If a wife should leave her husband, she must either remain single or else come back and make things right with him. And a husband has no right to get rid of his wife. He says, for the rest of you who are mixed Christians, that means you mix with an unbeliever, means you married a Jewish person, means you married a Muslim person, means you married an Arab, whatever it is that you marry. He's saying with that person, if they desire to stay married with you, stay married to them. But if they don't want to be married to you because now you've professed a life of Christianity and you're trying to live this life, it says, let them go. Yeah. Miss Patty. Lord. It says, for the rest of you who are married, uh, Christian married to, to non-Christians, we have to ex uh, we have no explicit command from the master. So this is what you must do. If you're a man with a wife who is not a believer, but who still wants to live with you, hold on to her. If you are a woman with a husband who is not a believer, but he wants to live with you, hold on to him. The believing husband shares to an extent in the holiness of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is likewise touched by the holiness of her husband. Otherwise, your children will be left out. As it is, they also are included in the spiritual purposes of God. On the other hand, if the unbelieving spouse walks out, you've got to let him go. You don't have to hold on desperately. God has called us to make the best of it as peacefully as we can. You never know, wife. The way you handle this might bring your husband not only back to you, but back to God. But see, when you're not whole, you can't think like that. 
You just worried about where you are and how he left me out. And he, he, he left me and the kids and we don't have nothing. And it's all about you. And God is saying your singleness, your Christianity, your life that I gave inside of you should show up in the midst of this because how you respond to this may attract all men, even your man, unto you. So marriage is only as good as your singleness. Write that down. Marriage is only as good as your So if your singleness sucks and you hate being by yourself, the person that's married to you is going to hate being with, it, with you. And likewise. Some of y'all were like, dang, it's too late for me now. I wish I would have known this before I got married. It's okay, but you can still work on yourself. Because in the midst of, 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 of singleness, you should be living your best life. Now, how many of y'all can proclaim that? I'm living my best life. I'm single. I do what I want to do. I can be I-N-D-E-P. I'm not going to spell it out last time because I think I messed up, so I'm not going to keep doing that. But when you're living your best life and another person is living their best life, then when you come together, everything is on an overflow. This is what the Bible says about marriage. It says that if you choose to be married, now, you should not choose to be married because you're sick of being lonely. So with Adam, and, and, and churches have preached, I've heard this my whole life, that, that marriage is the cornerstone of society. Anybody ever heard that? Marriage is, is, is the formation. But when God created male and female, he created them. He didn't create them married. He created them male and female. And then after Adam was around there naming the, the uh, animals and swinging from the trees and walking on the water and having all of that stuff, he said it's not good for this man to be alone because he's full and he can share a full life with another full person and they can come through and the love that they can give can be an overflow. So if you are not filled up yet, marriage is not going to change that. You need to find some friends. You need, to, you need to find out who you are. Because what God intends is that for a full person that's full of water, bloop, 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 all the way to the top, and another person that's filled up with, bloop, 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 and they give love to each other, what happens? Overflow. And when they're overflowing, guess what? They're flowing with each other to the point where now I don't need this from you. I love giving this to you. That's what a full person is all about. I can love you through this pain. I can love you through this because I'm, I'm full. But when you have and I pour everything into you, I'm depleted and I'm tired and I'm miserable and I don't want to cook for the kids and I don't want to do this and I'm tired of going out with you and I don't want to next with you and I don't want to sleep with you and all of this stuff happens because you're not whole. So when single folks marry people that, that are single, it's time for you to start being built up. Some of us really need to go to, to counseling. And it's okay. Or join the I group where you can talk about these things because when you're around other people, they can show you who you are. The Word of God does this for you. When you look at the Word of God and the Word of God is looking at you, it shows you who you are. The book of James says it's like going into the mirror and, and a person that, that walks away that forgets what they just saw. But he's, the Word of God will show you who you are. If you're inconsistent, if you incompetent, if you don't have good uh, hygiene skills or uh, hygiene tips or whatever it is that you got, the Bible will show you that. And you need to know how you smell. Because if you're not, then you'll walk around and wonder why everybody leaves when you come around because you're not self-aware. And when you have character issues and character flaws and you can't stand being around yourself, you think you want to bring somebody else in the midst of that. And God is like, that's not why I created marriage. So the Bible says through Paul, he says, it's better for you to stay unmarried. And that's okay. Say that with me. Say it's better to stay unmarried. It's better. I don't have to worry about nobody telling me nothing. If you got issues with submission, stay what? Single. If you don't like listening to people, take your egg and go home. Don't make no man have to deal with that. She don't want to submit because she's not fully complete. She's trying to draw the line in her marriage and stand up for who she is. That's not what marriage is about. It's not about you, you drawing your line in the sand and saying, well, I'm, I'm, st I'm standing on this and I won't budge. That's not, that's not what God intended marriage to be. So if you like sleeping by yourself, Stay by yourself. That's a gift.
God has given you the gift of celibacy. If you like going on dates by yourself, go by yourself. If you like eating out by yourself, go by. You don't like paying for other people's meals, go out by yourself. If you don't like sharing food on your plate and you want the whole pot of chitlins, then hey, guess what? Girl, stay. <laughs> so the reality is, is that you're not marked because you're single. That's just the lifestyle that you've chosen to live. Now, if you are doing what we was doing last week and we talked about the struggle with sex and all of that stuff, then maybe you might want to do something different. But guess what? Sexual addiction is not solved in marriage. It doesn't solve it. Because she ain't going to give you that much. Like, this ain't going to happen. Y'all know married folks like, shh. But single doesn't mean that you have to be alone. Just because you're single doesn't mean that you have to be alone. So this is what I realized about myself. I am a mover and a shaker. I get stuff done. That's, that's just me. I wake up in the morning at 3, in the, at 3 a.m. I got ideas. I'm reading the Bible. God has given me this, 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 and this. And I'm moving and I'm moving and I'm moving. And when I'm working in purpose, I don't think about being alone. It's only when I come to a place where my mind is idle, that's when I start feeling like, well, dang, I wish Sparkle was here. Or where the kids at? Or, or where, where are these things at? And, and then I had to go back and look at my single life. Whenever I was in the books, whenever I had stuff going on, I never thought about being by myself. But it was only when I was either lonely or I was by myself or I had no purpose or I wasn't working on anything, that's when I started to feel those things happen. But I didn't work through those things. I just went out and got another girl to... Feel that place. So I never really dealt with my own stuff. So as, as individuals, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with yourself? The way that you deal with yourself is you start investing in yourself. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and he'll start to add to you. So that means that wherever your deficiencies are, if you start seeking him in prayer and in scripture, he'll start to add to you and pour into you, and he'll fill you up. Since now when you're full, you don't go off like you used to do, and you don't cuss people out because they haven't taken anything from you. You can look at people that treat you wrong and be like, they have an issue. They have an egg issue, and I'm not going to be a part of that. Because when you hold, you don't deal with certain things. It's like now, now that y'all got good paying jobs and, and, and somebody may steal $100 from you, you're looking at, you know, you know what, that's 100 bucks. But if you broke and you took my last $100, it's going to be a fight because you, you don't have it. And God's will is for you to be healthy and, and whole. So now you got to be real with yourself. Are you really whole? Are you half a person? And if you're trying to avoid life because you are half, getting married won't allow you to be whole. It won't allow you to, to do and live your best life. The greatest commandment is this, to love God and to love your as you love your, but in society, we skip over the last part. We love God and we're always trying to love our neighbors, but we have so little self-love. And it shows up in all situations and at all times. You know why you don't love yourself? Because you don't like the way your hair looks. You think you can have a bad hair day. I never have a bad hair day. My clothes don't fit right. Think about the things that you say to yourself. If you will say that to yourself, you're going to love your neighbor the same way that you love yourself. So if you find friction with other people, then guess what? The issue is not with them. It's with you. So now we have to make a decision today. Is how we live out our wholeness. Some of you have already made the omelet. It's already kind of greenish. But thank God for Dr. Seuss. 
He loves green eggs and ham. Sam, I am. And the goal is that you have to already commit to loving the green eggs and the ham. Because here's what God will do. God will take this. And when you start seeking God and, and, and you start, start and you submit your, your marriage to him and you say, God, I know when we got into this thing, we were not whole people. And these single problems or these issues that, that are half are coming out right now, he'll start to season. That's why the Bible says be seasoned with salt. See, the issue is if you have a bad cake, how many bakers do I have? I know this is a fleeting generation. If the cake is too salty, is it the cake's fault? It was the ingredients that was put inside of the cake. So if there was too much salt in the cake before you bake the cake, the issue is not marriage. It is the ingredients. So you wonder why you have issues in marriage is because of you. Woman came to me. She said, she said Man, I got a devil in my marriage. I said, yeah, both of y'all devils. But it's, it's, it's easy to see the other person's flaws when we haven't loved ourselves first. So in, in singleness, we have to learn to love God and then love ourselves. God just put that in the middle because he didn't want you to skip over that because you can get so love and fall in love with yourself that you forget other people. But now that I know that I have to love who I am, I got to love myself big, I got to love myself small, I got to love my tallness, my skinniness, my, my leg, I walk with a limp, my, my, my leg is shorter than the other ones, my hips are a little off, my lips are too big, mine are too small, my, my hair's a little nappy, mine is too straight, I'm, I'm too light skinned, I'm too dark skinned. You got to love who you are. And don't let anybody tell you that you're less than because God made you who you are. He made you healthy and he made you whole. And if you don't like it, it doesn't matter because I'm whole. You don't like me because you got half of you. See, now when you fool, you can start seeing everybody around me is screwed up. Why is everybody around me screwed up? Probably because screwed up people attract screwed up people. So, Pastor, are you saying that we need to be perfect? No, but you should be striving for perfection. And the way that you do that is through Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one that's really going to show you who you are. He's the only one that's going to show you how to make uh, something good out of that omelet that wasn't good at first. He's the only one that can show you how to pull some of that salt out. So I asked my wife, I was driving, I was like, well, well, if you put too much salt in something, how can you get it out? She said, well, my grandmother used to put a potato in it. And what potatoes do is it extracts stuff outside of things that is already, that's country stuff. So some of y'all don't know about that. But you put a potato in it and potatoes will extract some of that salt. So I said, well, Jesus is like the potato, like the, the, the potato when you put the potato inside of stuff that's already screwed up. It'll start to extract some of that negativity, those thoughts that are not good, those uh, behaviors that are not like Christ, that, 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 those, those thinking, thinking things that you have in your life. The, the, the potato will draw it out. But without the potato, you just nasty, not good for nothing. But with Christ. He can make you whole. So I submit to you is that the only way that you can get over a broken heart is to add a little Jesus into the flavor. The only way that you can get from point A to point B, the only way that you can get over that addiction, the only way you can't do it by yourself, the only thing that you can do is you got to put a potato in it. So when you go home today and you start arguing with your spouse or with your kids, just throw a potato, a, a symbolic potato and walk away. Because it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's about his spirit. That's the only thing that will change how you feel about yourself, your marriage, your omelets, and even in your life after Love is through God's power and might. All my single people make some noise. See, even if you're not whole, because what single means, single means whole. It means one. It means full. It, it's, 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 it's a single. So even though you're married, 
you're still a single. So all of my single people make some noise. No, no, no. I need some people that are, I need you to declare that you are whole today. That I'm going to start working towards my wholeness. If you are single, make some noise. Because God wants you to be whole and healthy. Because when two come together, then the Bible says two are better than not two halves. Because two halves equal one, that means that something is going to be lacking today. Let us stand on our feet around the building. When the Bible says, come unto me, all you who are weary, burdened, and heavy laden. He says, I'll give you rest. The first thing that you need to do now, the Bible says too, is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. How many of you have done it? Raise your hand. Say, I've confessed. I've confessed with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Keep it up there high because now you're saying that I'm on my way to wholeness. I'm on my way to wholeness. I'm on my way to wholeness. Say that. I'm on my way to wholeness. I'm on my way. I'm on my way to being whole. God, I'm on my way. I know I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way to being whole. He says, once you confess that Jesus is Lord, he says, then you got to believe it in your heart that I am. And then he says, believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, because that means that not only am I whole, but I got power. Say, I got power. I got power to overcome some things that, that I didn't think I could overcome. Because Jesus, he will fix it. If you allow him to. Let us bow. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the whole people that are in the room. We thank you for those that are single and excited about being single. We thank you for those that are excited about being single and okay with being single because you've given them the world at their fingertips to explore and to enjoy life being single, God. But we also thank you, Lord, for those that have chosen to get married because they're full and they want to share their overflowing love with the other person. Show them how to show love, God. To give and receive love. And Father, we pray for those that are struggling in their singleness. They, they hear the message, but they can't allow themselves to get there. Work on their heart today, Father. Not by our might, not by our power, but by your spirit today, Father. I pray that you will give them an overwhelming feeling of love, of acceptance, of joy, of power, of completion, of your grace and your mercy in their spirits today, Father. Make them whole. That they will be single whole and healthy for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. All my single people, make some noise. Hey, hey! Now, we got work to do. I got work to do. Anybody else got work to do? Anybody else got? I got some work to do. Look at them and say, you're going to make it though. You Tell them you look good. Because God created you that way. You, hey, you good. You good. You believe it? You good. Wherever you are right now, you are good. Because God says all things are possible to them that believe. So I believe it's good. And it's going to be good. And I'm good. And I'm good. Because that's how God created me to be good.